No. I'm not worried at all. I rely on God, Allah. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Life Hack podcast. Today we have a regular guest for the podcast returning with a new publication. Yes, we have Sheikh Dawood Walid with us, who is uh, an Islamic teacher, a researcher, an activist, and a published author. And his latest book, Futuwa and Raising Males into Sacred Manhood. So this is uh, Sheikh Dawood Walid's latest book, and we would like to actually use the majority of the podcast actually to discuss this book and some of the gems that are contained within it. So we'd like to welcome you to the podcast, Sheikh Dawood Walid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's my pleasure to uh, be back here with you on Life Hot Podcast. Uh, we appreciate your generosity with your time. And it seems that you might be uh, fighting a little bit of a cold as well. Yeah, there's a little something <clears throat> in my throat, inshallah. There's no COVID-19 going on, but there's quite a few people in our community who went to a to a nikah that end up being kind of like mm -hmm. a little super spreader. So inshallah, everything is, oh, okay. is okay, inshallah. Tahurun, inshallah. So Jazamakhir for um showing uh some courage and fortitude in the face of uh you know uh, being ill and whatnot. But uh this book here, um I want to ask you firstly, uh, I actually finished reading this book. Uh Jazamakhir, by the way, uh Sheikh Daud, uh, you sent me a copy of this book. I really appreciated that beautiful gift. Uh what was the impetus for you to write this book? A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So uh, the impetus of this book comes about from three different things. One, <clears throat> my own personal observations. Two, some of the uh, observations and also um, we say even complaints that some of our teachers have seen with some of the younger generation of males. And then three, uh, parents and even single sisters who were coming asking the question, where are all the upright brothers at? Where are the responsible young men at? Right. So it's based upon <clears throat> this, which was the impetus of the book. Uh, one that I can say in the uh, Western context, uh, America and in Canada, and I will also uh, by extension say the UK, that there is a issue that uh, not just Muslims, but non-Muslims have been talking about in terms of two things. One is an issue called delayed adolescence in which young people in general, but especially young men aren't tasked with responsibility. In fact, are, are pampered and this leads to an issue of delayed adolescence. And the term that I use is called the mama's boy syndrome, which is running rampant uh, in Western societies in general, <clears throat> and which includes the Muslim community. This is one factor. Then the other factor is, is the uh, gender confusion movement that has been working hard to emasculate men and to bring and to try to deconstruct traditional masculinity, right? And this has had an effect on softening up uh, a lot of uh, young brothers and actually making them, uh, I can even say, scary, scary cats uh, in, in a sense. <clears throat> so this is one thing that I observed, as well as some of my elders, and we've talked about for a number of years. And then the issue of, of um, the reality of it is, is that a lot of sisters in our community, number one, who've never been married, or two, those who maybe are uh, approaching middle age, they're divorcees, uh, have been coming to uh, our Imam's council for years saying, where are the brothers at? That it seems to be that there is a, uh, a lack of quality brothers 
for our sisters of Mary who are upright, taking responsibility, who are practicing Quran and Sunnah in a in, in a proper way, right? So um, this is kind of the background that led to me um, writing the book and um, you know doing peer review. <clears throat> uh, Molana Asim Ayub, who's in UK High Wycombe, he wrote the introduction. Even of the people I spoke to, as well as uh, some of my teachers here, and uh, as well as speaking to uh, some people not only uh, in West Africa but also in in Turkey. So this is kind of the background behind uh, the production of the book. Okay, does that uh, uh, I think a lot of people. The the reason. I think uh, not only do I appreciate that, but a lot of people uh, have similar sentiments of what you mentioned. Is it different in this generation than previous generations? Because doesn't always the elder generation say, oh, the young generation is weak. They, uh, they don't come from our time where we had to walk to school, you know, both ways uphill in the snow. You know what I mean? So are we living in a more unique time? Is this more different? Is there something especially challenging of our current generation as opposed to just say previous generations um, who maybe had similar sentiments that this latest generation hasn't had to deal with the challenges that we dealt with and thereby uh, they haven't been able to develop certain skills or strengths because of that? So there is a level of, of credence to that point. And this is a product we could say of uh, what is called modernity, right? So it is true that like my grandparents' generation, my grandfather would say to my father's generation, oh, you guys didn't do all what we had to do, or you guys are a little, you know, not as tough as my generation, right? <clears throat> and then likewise, mm -hmm. My father's generation, uh, who grew up in the 60s, for instance, would say the same thing about people, you know, my generation, it was called Generation X. And that is true. Uh, modernity, uh, you know, a, a number of conveniences. Um, and then also, um, perhaps for some of us, um, perhaps our grandparents or great grandparents came from more so blue collar or working class or worked in fields, whereas now, you know, uh, many of us can have the luxury of working from home during a pandemic, right? So like, it's, it's very different uh, in, in some regards, but in other regards, the decline of certain traditional masculine virtues has rapidly eroded. And it is quite different, I can say, from when I was growing up. I wrote in the book that, you know, it was not uncommon for people in my generation growing up in Virginia that you know we had rites of passage you know we actually did work we were expected by a certain age that we were going to do some work um you know we were taken out to like learn how to hunt and you know and like so for instance if you were going to our community now that does the average young man even know how to do the biha properly you know for like Udhiya, right, during the hot season, they even know how to slaughter an animal properly, right? I mean, it's just maybe it's like a small example, but we were expected to take on certain responsibilities and we got to a certain age, you were considered to be a young man. And so this whole thing about delayed adolescence, at least for my generation, it was totally unacceptable just to lay around and be a, a, a guy and even go to school and you know even graduate from school and just be content with sitting at home playing video games and not going out to take any further responsibility uh in your community to not even think about seriously making plans to get married but now it's it's no issue for a 26 year old a 30 year old guy to be very comfortable being single but not thinking about wanting to go out and do some some broader things in society uh, it's it's now that's commonplace. As a matter of fact, there's even elders that will encourage people to delay getting married. You know, um, so th this is this is a, a cultural shift. And um, outside of so-called modernity, I think that you know some of this has to do with the ideas of of, of so-called progressivism, the uh, the 
the the various alphabet movements uh, without naming all the alphabets because the alphabets relate to sexuality and gender as well as race uh, have done something to uh, decrease or even strip some of us from certain like core issues that are fitra we are part of the the fitra of of, of the males uh, that's being like uh, there's, there's, there's social engineering that's going on. So I do think that um, it's quite different uh, raising children or being a young man in, in, in 2022 than, let's say, 1982. I think there is a, I think there's, there's a, there's a, a stark contrast. Mm. I recall listening to a, a speech by Malcolm X. It's not a, a, a really a popular one that's played a lot, uh, but I remember listening to this excerpt where he talks about one of the uh, reasons to take away the manhood from his people, right? Like, you know, masculinity, the, the, the man, you know, because of that, he said that came from slavery because when you take away a person's like, you know, the, all the traditional characteristic traits that go along with manhood, you no longer have a people who will resist. You know what I mean? Say an, like an overarching agenda or, uh, you know, whatever ideology that is being perpetrated on society, uh, it, it would be like the men, right? The resistance fighters, the intellectuals, the philosophers, uh, you know, out of sense of like and courage and like standing up for the hawk or whatever. It's like, how can you as a man let this thing happen, right? You know, it's it, it would be common to all cultures, right? So he, uh, he was alluding to the fact that that, uh, and this is before, you know, we see in our era, obviously, where uh, certain, uh, you know, strands of progressivism has certain agendas. Uh, but um, even in his time, right, the, you know, this, this, uh, the late 50s, 60s, he's mentioning this specifically about the manhood being taken away. You know, it's almost like he was seeing something happening. Do you, do you feel that... Uh, it is by design or do you think it's more apathy in our community that just because of convenience, we no longer take responsibility really of any uh, of every and of anything, or do you feel that this, a lot of this is by design? So, um, you know, again, you know, certain responsibilities that we had to take as men, I wouldn't say responsibilities, I me mean, is that the best word, certain efforts that men had to do in the past because of modernity uh, have not necessitated. For instance, you know, we don't have to go out and hunt meat and slaughter meat regularly because we can go to a halal butcher or we can go to a store and get that meat, right? It's not, it, it's not the way that it used to be, for instance, where people literally had to go out and get food back in, back in the old days, including in the time of, 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 of Malcolm growing up. He talked about growing up in in michigan and they would go out and and they were raising and eating from their own chickens and their own rabbits and things like that he talked about that in his autobiography right um you know even time when people didn't have refrigerators to 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 even hold meat for a long time right so i mean modernity is a part where it's made and brought about more ease but i do think that there is a level of 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 social engineering from the metaphysical level, of course, it is a shaitan's goal to humiliate the insan and to whisper into the hearts of people to try to move them away from their fitra, from el fitra, from that noble design that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings to function in uh, as females and as males, and we believe as Muslims that gender is a divine construct. It's not a man-made construct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the dhakr and the untha. And he said he made these, right? In Surah Hujurat, Ya ayyuhal nasana khalaqnakum min dhakrin wa untha. So this shows us that gender is a divine construct, right? So shaitan uh, seeks to uh, influence us, right? But, but you know, also uh, this is the the people who are working uh, for a shaitan, the shayateen, and those people who are working to usher in the era of the jet, 
And again, I, I talk about this not simply from a social science perspective. I think as Muslims, we have to always start off from our spiritual perspective, right? That there is a plan to try to deceive the children of Adam to bring in a social order that is Dajjalic. And this is part of our understanding as people who believe in the Quran and Sunnah to the extent, to the extent that one of the signs of the hour that we are told in the Hadith that Sahih, that the Prophet alayhi salam, he forecasted and said that there would come a time for every, what we say, khamsin imra'a, this is a language in Arabic, for every 50 women, there will be one al qayyim wahid There'll be one, there'll mm -hmm. only be one upright man for every 50 women. Now notice in the hadith, he didn't say 50 females. For every 50 females, there's one male. It doesn't say 50 females for every one male. And, and, and scholars such as Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani have commented on this. It's not a differentiation where there's going to be 50% more women. It's going to be this thing where for every one male, you have 50 women. This is not the understanding that we take from this, that there is a Dajjalic plan to strip males of masculinity, right? And there will come a time that for 50 women, there will be one upright man who's upright according to prophetic masculinity, and those others will be stripped of it. And then there will be a reversal of roles in which you will see women imitating men, and not just in dress. We're not talking about cross-dressing. Women imitating men and women excuse me, men imitating women in roles and women imitating men in roles, right? So mm. I don't think this is by happenstance. I think according to our understanding of the Quran and Islamic eschatology, this is a this is a uh, an evil plan. And we're starting to see the manifestations of devilish social engineering against the children of Adam. It seems that... <laughs> Even with the non-Muslim, uh, the trends are unsettling. And you see things like the red pill movement. I'm sure you've heard of this red pill movement. And uh, many Muslims have ascribed to this. How uh, is Fatuwa different than that? Because that seems like reactionary where people in general sense feel wrong and even Muslims are jumping on this bandwagon. But what you put forth on this book sounds a little bit different, much different, actually. Yeah, so our our framework of sacred manhood is mm. The Prophet mm. he is the definition of sacred manhood. And some of the scholars have said that Fatua uh, or Islamic chivalry, sacred chivalry, in its fullest expression means following the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salam in its entirety. In its entirety. It is embodying the sunnah inwardly and outwardly, right? So this is what we would say. And this uswa, uswatun hasana, is based upon what is called al wasatiya And sacred manhood is following this prophetic example, not going too far to the right, nor too far to the left outside of it. So you have one extreme, sometimes breeds another extreme, but we aren't to be the people of extremes. As the prophetic saying says, the best of matters is what is in the middle, right? So we don't believe that it's true manhood to be an, an effeminate, softy, emasculated, like punk type of type of person, right? Much less trying to dress like a woman or saying someone's gender fluid or whatever. That's that's even further like way out there. But the answer to that, sacred manhood is not all of what's in the red pill movement is not being a brute, is not treating women 
the same way you would treat a man. It doesn't mean that you uh, conquer women through zina, you know, and some of these other things, you know, that, that, of, of looking at women as simply being like property. That's not the answer either, right? So we have a framework and we have virtues that are based in transcendent beliefs and principles, which the starting point is the Quran. And I also see it's about red pill, right? And, and this is just in general for our brothers. Any ideology or any movement that is based in kufr is going to be problematic. Red pill, red pill movement comes from kufr. So there may be some things mm -hmm. in it that we may see are meritorious, just like critical race theory. There are some observations in critical race theory that we could say we could agree with. But anything that's based in kufr, is asl is kufr, then that's not the way we should be following. We shouldn't be flying that flag, right? We don't need critical race theory Muslims or critical gender studies Muslims or so-called progressive Muslims. And we don't need alt-right Muslims. We don't need red pill Muslims, right? Because that is going outside of the wasatiya that Imam Ghazali talked about in Mizan, in, uh, Mizan al-Amal in his book on Islamic ethics. Our goal is the heart of the matter is the wasat. And the wasat is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Mm. And one thing uh, I find with a lot of these movements or a lot of these theories to try to bring some type of social order or reconstruct something they feel is lost is that you inevitably end up with contradictions. You know, like there, um, I saw a clip actually earlier today about um, there was some, uh, I, I don't know, some, some government body, I think, maybe a municipal government body or something like that, one of the cities in the United States. Anyhow, um, they uh, they were delaying um, meeting for, for some type of important issue. And the reason given was that um, urgency in dealing with issues is a white supremacist, you know, ideology or, or principle, right? And then people were looking at like, you know, they, they were astounded, like, why are you using that as an excuse? You're just trying to give this as an excuse to not deal with this particular issue. And then uh, one of the, there, it, basically there's two people, it's like a news program, and one of them was defending um, what, uh, you know, the actions of what this board was doing. Uh, and the other person was always, was trying to call to reason, saying this doesn't make any sense. But what I found was when the person was trying to defend it, they were contradicting themselves. So they're saying, yeah, you know, like, you know, us as black people, uh, we have our own timeline. And, you know, uh, and, and, you know, when they're saying urgency, like we have to look at the history of black people, like, you know, for example, that uh, women in, um, uh, you know, are, though they don't have access to health care and things like that. And I was thinking to myself, you just contradicted yourself because, if they don't have access to healthcare, and and and, and you know, uh, you know, black women don't have a lot of the treatments uh, that are being that they need, that should be a sense of urgency. You would want urgency for them, right? So it just seemed like when she was trying to justify it, she was contradicting uh, herself. And I thought to myself, you know, the the eye in the Quran, if it wasn't from uh, other than Allah, you would have found it in many contradictions. And yep. I feel like a lot of these social movements, whether it's to re restore manhood, whether it's to restore racial justice, they always end up contradicting themselves. You know what I mean? There's always contradictory, uh, you, you establish a certain rule, but then it contradicts with another rule because you don't agree uh, with it. And so when we're establishing our principles, is that something important for us to be aware of? Because if we go through the prophetic example, there is consistency, right? So is that an important thing for us um, to appreciate in the prophetic model of developing uh, manhood? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, consistency. And uh, consistency is based upon truth. And it's based mm -hmm. upon, firstly, we're talking about truth, truthfulness of our intention 
And this is a very important part because without truth, there is no proper consistency, right? There's going to be mm. uh, conflicts, not only in speech and action, but even within an ideology. So this is a good segue of where the book on Fatua and what the scholars of Fatua wrote about that the foundational principle that we look at for sacred manhood is a sitq, is truthfulness, mm. right? And this is based upon the authentic hadith uh, by our beloved prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a sitq yahdi al bir, min al bir yahdi al jannah, that sitq, truthfulness, guides to al bir, which is kalima jamia. It's a word that has rich meaning that means the noble traits of character we could say it's more than just piety and then this el bir then leads one to the paradise now the sidq has various components it's first sidqania that we are sincere in our intention right then this sincerity and intention should lead us towards the sincerity of intention or truthfulness of intention leads us to truthfulness in speech and then truthfulness to action. And with this truthfulness of niya, truthfulness of qal, truthfulness of amal, then we have with it to compound it or to fortify it is sikul azm. It is truthfulness in being determined and being consistent of having truthful intentions, pure intentions, seeking to speak the truth, which means verifying what we say that it is truth and it's not false, and that our actions, including keeping our time commitments, right, is based in the truth because Abu Bakr Siddiq, he said, He said this in his opening khutbah of being elected to be Khalifa. He said, truthfulness is amana. And falsehood or lying is kiana, is treachery, right? So, um, mm. you know, it, it means the urgency of keeping our time. When we say we're going to be somewhere at a certain time, then because of our truthfulness, we keep that amana and we don't waste other people's time. When something is urgent, we give it its proper due and its right because of its urgency. And we're not lackadaisical about it, right? Like if someone needs serious health care, for instance, and this is the conflict you brought up with these wokesters, right? If something is mm -hmm. urgent, you can't say on the one hand, it's white supremacists to keep treat things urgently, but then you say these black women need this health care for dire conditions because it's urgent. That's that's a conflict. And that's because they're starting from a place of al kathib falsehood, not starting from mm. sin. This is very important for us as the Muslim men. And this is the number one trait that we need to try to embody and transmit to the young men so that when we have sons we're raising, when we are leaders of youth groups, um, when we are doing activities with the brothers, that this has to be the first principle that we are seeking to embody and to instill. Hmm. I think another point that you make in your book uh, that relates to that is that there's a difference between between doing something out of love for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and doing something based on lust and desire, right? So that when you do something uh, for the sake for the love of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala then inherently that's linked to the, that you're going to follow the truth that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas if you do base something based on um, desire, that's where you're going to get all that, you know, corruption. That's where you're going to get all those contradictions, you know. Uh, and, and, and so when you look at, for example, how you were speaking about Futua, you know, being kind, respectful, uh, serving your parents uh you know the the scholars right the or you know in a, in a traditional sense serving our scholars uh and then our neighbors you're saying so there is a level of consistency here and nowhere do i see okay uh color here i don't see black and white i don't see uh you know any of these other 
divisions. This seems more, uh, you know, wholesome in terms of being able to uh, bring communities together or even being able to engage with a community in an upright manner. You know, so it, uh, a lot of these characteristic traits that you that you mentioned that you as you go through, none of them are at odds with one another. And it seems like it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't really it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, somebody growing up in Turkey, somebody growing up in the Bronx, uh, you know, somebody, you know what I mean? These are all truistic character traits. How important it, is it for us to focus on that in an era of identity politics where certain issues be, become almost uh, like akin to like uh, like the most virtuous principles that one could aspire to. Like, how do we like you know what is you know what is the superiority of what you are uh, of what is being put forth here in terms of um, that universality? Yeah. So you know we aspire in the Islamic paradigm, the perfect paradigm is that our ultimate goal in everything we do should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this is all of what we are striving for, though we will all for, fall short because none of us are like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sense that he was always on that and we are striving to emulate that model. Um, you know, so that's the goal. And this is the beauty of him being a universal prophet, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned the Quran wa ma'ar sonaka illa kafatin the nasi bashir and ladir and like kinna akhtar nasi la yalamun. He was sent to be sufficient for all of humankind. And what, of course, differentiates him from the other prophets who were sent just for their particular nation or tribe, he had uh, the Prophet sallam, was an Adnani Arab, but he also had Qahtani Arabs amongst the Sahaba. There were two there were two strands of Arabs. Um, he had companions who were Nubians and Abyssinians who were Persians. Uh, and then those Sahaba, may Allah be well pleased with them as Islam spread out. You had people from the Tabi'in who were from the uh from the Indian subcontinent and people from Egypt and other places that uh, became part of the, the Byzantines or the Greeks uh who became part of the of the first three generations right so the what is universal is the transcendent beliefs and the virtues to be instilled and that is to be the primary focus without erasing anyone's culture but we don't make our cultures our qibla that's the main point so mm. there's nothing wrong with i mean it's well known like we we call like Amongst Ahlul Sunnati wa Jama'ah, we look at the most authentic book of Hadith, the Sahih al Bukhari. Well, he's from Bukhara. It's literally talking about his culture and where he came from, right? We look at Salman, we know him not even by his father's name. We know Salman as Salman al Farisi, Salman the Persian. We know Bilal by Bilal al Habashi, Bilal the Abyssinian. So it's not to say that we try to erase. Our, our, our cultural uh, identities, but that cultural identity doesn't trump the the Islamic identity. And that identity is based upon submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sacred virtues that we were taught by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that was transmitted to the Sahaba, that was transmitted to Tabi'een in an unbroken chain that reaches us today. This is very important. Mm -hmm. This tradition that we're talking about of Fatua, we have an unbroken chain. It goes back for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abu Bakr Siddiq, and we can trace this back to great people, Hassan al-Basri, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, and we can trace it back to Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, we can trace it, right? And it's and, 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 and there's continuity in, in these, in these mm -hmm. virtues. So anyone that tries to teach virtues or teach behaviors that counter these virtues, then we reject that. Why? Because we have the chain of transmission of these virtues. Anything 
that tries to undermine that transmission, we say it's volatile. We don't accept it. Mm. Now, <clears throat> you know, dealing with a lot of young brothers, uh, myself, um, in our Dow activities and uh, in, in universities and whatnot, uh, we, we, we've developed different programs. So we have different, whether it's haraqat, educational, tarbiyah programs. The problem that we face, Sheikh, is that people recognize what's good and what's virtuous. So you never have a brother rejecting the messaging or what you would even present in any one of these chapters in your book. No one can probably, no one would dispute that. No one would really dispute it because it's something that the fitra would recognize. The problem becomes when you try to now inculcate it, you try to practice it, you try to make it a part of you, you try to change yourself. And when you find your family lifestyle is inconsistent, uh, the world around you is inconsistent with these principles, then you might recognize it, but it's hard to develop the will and discipline to resist this environment around you to make those types of changes. What is your advice in regards to that? So we as a community, we have to put more resources and effort into this. So normally the first place to reinforce these values would be the home. Um, and then the broader community, right? The reality of it is, is that number one, because of this society that we live in, many fathers are living lives that are so hectic as far as working long hours, commuting, that many times they're not even giving the proper time to their sons for the tarbiya, uh, much less the growing phenomenon we have of mothers who are single trying to raise their sons. And mothers can do a good job in, in, in instilling certain values and virtues, but a woman can't teach a man, a boy on her own, how to be a man, because she's not a man, right? She, she, mm -hmm. simply, she, she simply can't do it. Even the prophet, who, whose fitra was always intact, his father passed away before he was born, but then he had his grandfather step in, Abdul Muttalib, right? He stepped in when, when Abdul Muttalib passed away, then Abu Talib stepped in. So there was always some male mentorship in, in looking after him that he could see some people with, with certain behaviors about how to walk as a man in Meccan society, right? Um, and then also just to be realistic, it's harder for us to help preserve the virtues in ourselves, much less uh, young males and teenagers because of the spiritual assault that we have that Muslims never had before, because back in the day, uh, like in the time of the Abbasids, or the Abbasian or the, or the Ottomans, there was no TV and laptops and smartphones with all of these images and, and the propaganda wasn't like how it is now, right? Um, but this is why I talk about in the book about the need for us. And this has been done in a few localities. People are working on it and we've been working on it in Detroit. I mentioned it in my book, but a sincere effort to try to establish what we could say are Fatua guilds in our localities. And the mm -hmm. Fatua guild concept, which really the scouts copied, right? Like the, the Cub Scouts, the Boy Scouts, the Eagle Scouts, in America, they're not called the, the Boy Scouts anymore because LGBTQ sued them saying it was discriminatory. So they had to drop the boys and now girls can go in and trans, so-called trans men can be Eagle Scouts. So it's the Boy Scouts are ruined, mm -hmm. right? The Scouts are ruined um, of, of much of the good that it did have from a Christian perspective. It's, it's been ruined. But the Fatua Guilds is a format of having a center location that you bring the young males to regularly, if not on a daily basis, on a regular basis, in which there's a certain tartib or a certain format that they go through. So number one, there is uh, the religious instruction that's needed. Number two, it is 
the teacher, which helps to embody and show them proper adab about how to act in proper situations, right? There is the aspect of helping train the young men in martial arts because martial arts and wrestling uh, helps with instilling discipline. As a matter of fact, there's a book out now, I believe it's called Prophetic Grappling. It's a translation of Esuyuti's work. Esuyuti wrote a small book on the Hadith on prophetic wrestling and prophetic martial arts, we can say, in the time of the Sahaba, right? So these are Sunnah activities, mm -hmm. right? Um, for self-defense, but also this helps instill discipline, right, of mm -hmm. the martial arts. Then there's also the, the activity of the khidma, of the service or the community service, and there's community service activities. Um, and again, this is all done organized. This isn't just done on a one-off thing. There is structure in the Fatua Guild, and you have younger people who come in, and once they have gone through it and they are seen to have graduated, then you have like a rites of passage and you graduate them to a higher level. And then they help assist and help bring up the new young brothers, the new recruits, the new people who are leaving a stage of adolescence and to a stage of being mukallifin, of being responsible for their deen. And then we don't call them boys. We treat them like young men because they're responsible according to Sharia. So we don't say you're a boy. We say we treat them like young men so they rise to the occasion to act like men. We don't say, oh, the boys. We don't refer to 17-year-old, 18-year-olds as boys. Um, Abdullahi ibn Umar, Ibn al-Khattab, uh, Prophet وسلم, gave him permission to go out in Ghazwa at the age of 15 years old. He was mukallif. You know, he was, he was a, at 15 years old, Abdullah ibn Umar was a man, and the Prophet treated him like such. Usama ibn Zayd was a teenager when he was elected to be commander. He's a, he, was a, he was treated like a man. The Prophet وسلم, married him off as a teenager to Fatima ibn Qais. He was a man. So we need organization and discipline on a multiple level, organizing our communities. And this takes financial investment, right? But more so, it takes investment and time, right? And mm -hmm. I believe if we establish these Fatua guilds in our localities, we put in the money and the resources that we can, we can, we will be able to see a change in our community from what I talked about that I saw 10 years ago to where we're at now. I think with, with the fuddle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, following the sunnah, following the way of our pious predecessors, those who were righteous amongst like Anas al Allah, who was the Abbasid Sultan, following some of the righteous people of the Saljuks, like like uh like like Urtural, right? I mean Resurrection Urtural shows a model of like mm. the Fatua Guild, showing some of the what the Ottomans systematized like we've been given the models already like we don't have to try to reinvent the mm -hmm. wheel we just need to kind of tailor it to our reality of living in north america sheikh what kind of responsibilities do we need to start teaching like life skills and responsibilities do we need to start teaching our boys to become men Okay, so number one, uh, I, I it should go without saying, but I have to say it. Firstly, is their fardin ayn, like their responsibilities, their individual responsibilities according to the Sharia. That's the first thing that needs to be instilled. Which, unfortunately, a lot of young uh, males and females can go off to uh, university. And they can quote a lot of social theories and they don't even know they're far nine, right? So that's number one, as far as from a Shari'i perspective. That's the first thing. The second thing is, as far as what needs to be t taught and responsibility, that not that in a in a broad sense or a macro sense, that you are not responsible only for yourself. Your first responsibility is for your own soul with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but that you aren't simply responsible for only yourself and you have greater accountability than just for yourself. You have accountability and responsibility 
of serving your family and your blood kin, first starting with your parents. And of your two parents, your mother has the greatest. You have the responsibility to be a benefit and not be apathetic of what's going on in your community, which then extends outside of your house to looking after the needs of your neighbors, right? And by neighbors, we're talking about a community at the least 40 houses to the right and 40 to the left, 40 before and 40 behind. This means community when we talk about neighbors, right? The responsibility that you have to the Ummah of Nabi, uh, of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, that when there's any insult or any injury uh, to the Ummah that we should be trying to give if not our financial support, if we don't have money, our moral support to help the ummah wherever there is suffering starting in our locality, in our area, and then going abroad. And then also specifically that we should feel that we have a responsibility for our women folk to be that qayyim wahid, that we should have a sense of ghaira, of type of uh, vigilant care, a type of positive, jealous protectiveness for our women folk in particular, right? Like this is a responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to those who are uh, who are men, uh, what we could say al-haqiqi, right? The real men. Uh, they have a responsibility to preserve and protect the dignity and the honor of the, uh, of the women folk, right? And with that, of those who we have the first, the primary responsibility is that we seek to follow the sunnah, the sunnah mu'akada, that we seek to actually get married, that we don't have monasticism, we don't have priests in Islam, we don't take vows of celibacy forever, we should seek to get married, and the first one that we seek to look after is our wife. And in fact, if we are given more, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's provisions and we are responsible, right? Um, you know, um, and not for lustful reasons, then we look after more than one woman. We can look up, to, we can look after up to four women, right? So uh, in, 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 the, in the most like intimate personal sense without violating the guidelines of the Sharia. So I think these are some very practical, basic things that we can focus on to say, you have this responsibility. And of course, going back to the first point, in our responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing our fault and ayn is also knowing that our bodies, our lives are an amana. They're a sacred trust. So we are also responsible for looking after not just our spiritual souls, but our physical bodies, which also means that we need to look after this body and try to take care of it and keep in shape because we're going to be questioned on the day of judgment about our body and this leads me to another point that the whole slogan my body my choice is bottle your body mm -hmm. doesn't belong to you my body doesn't belong to me our bodies belong to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lillahi ma fi samawati wa ard everything in the heavens and the earth including our bodies all belong to allah our bodies are in a manna that we're going to be questioned about, and we have the free will to uh, obey or disobey. And if we disobey, there, there can be worldly consequences as well as consequences in the akhirah. But this whole business about my body, my choice, I can do whatever I want. Uh, well, no, you can't. But if you want to, there's consequences. Right. But mm. our bodies don't belong to us. You know, so that's something that we have to consider, not just of men, but maybe of the women folk who are watching this and you pass this along to those people who who parroting that feminist talking point, my body, my choice. That is not a Quranically compliant slogan. You mentioned marriage. Why do you think there's a trend in our community? And if we want to just focus on the brothers uh, in, in light of this book, why is there a trend in the community do you feel to delay marriage? It seems uh, there isn't an importance. I, I saw the shift just within my generation. There is a big uh, importance uh, and uh, it, it was on the forefront of 
you know, young brother's minds. Oh, I have to get, I have to get a good job. I have to get married. Like these were the the two yeah. things that uh, was forefront in their minds that they have to do this. And sometimes they want to get married, but they realize, oh, well, maybe I have to get a job first before I get married. But the marriage was like usually superior in terms of what was on their mind. But it seems like it's become um, less and less uh, of an urgency. And it's also at the same time, it, it seems almost like the capacity of getting marriage has also diminished, meaning that uh, the men don't even have an idea of what they're looking for when they get married, how they should go about getting married, what they're going to do when they get married. So it seems like capacity on one has diminished, but also desire has diminished. What do you think the reason for that is? I think the primary driver behind that is not El Fitra, but societal expectations. The societal expectations have changed drastically in the last 30 years uh, than, than how it is right now. So there was a societal expectation that you do your studies and you work to get married. I mean, you work and that when you're able to, you get married and you don't need to be filthy rich, but you build a life with your wife. Again, you build a life with your wife. So and I'm I'm saying that on purpose rhyming that hopefully you can remember it. Back in the day, you, you work to build your life with your wife. Right now, the expectations have changed. Right now, even the parents will will discourage their sons from marrying young and tell them, oh, well, you know, you need to have this many of degrees. You should have your 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 master's degree or your PhD. You need this level of type of house and this level of type of income. And then you can go and look for your wife and do, as they say in, in Urdu, and then you get your rukhsati, right? Um, mm. Like that that's something that's that's changed. That's a societal thing. And that's uh, a, a macro issue in the broader culture that's become a micro issue within the Muslim community. Then you also have expectations uh, that, you know, um, in my community, there's some brothers who want to get married, but the, and they want to marry uh, a Muslim sister who's modest, but um, they can't afford to because the mahar price is set so high. Um, mm. The the expectations also from the bride side and the family is 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 so outrageously high that you know men folk are like, well, you know, I can't afford to get married, and they almost like give up on on, on getting married at the age that their shahwa for women is the strongest. And this is why, uh, this is why I believe that, statistically speaking, at least a, a study by ISPU has said that about half of young Muslims, men and women, are committing zina, right? And the young men um, simply, you know, uh, aren't able to get married. Some of them who want to get married, if they don't come from a family with money, and I tell parents this all the time. Uh, especially to parents of daughters, but this goes for sons too, that when you block the halal for your children, you facilitate the haram for them, right? When you block the halal, you facilitate the haram. You push them towards haram, right? Mm -hmm. So th these these are two these are these are two problems that are interconnected, I believe. Do you think uh, a part of it also is um, you know? like uh, the shift that we've seen in the culture, the access to men and women has become much more easier, right? So brothers and sisters can interact with each other. Men and women can interact with each other very easily. You know, back in the days, <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if even many of the younger viewers are going to get this reference, but the only reason, way you could communicate, if you wanted to communicate with a girl, you have to get her home phone number and then call and then you know the parents might pick up so there's it's not an easy path nor vice versa it's not a easy way to communicate with with one another and generally speaking even in in, in public schools there was more segregation 
right? There wasn't, uh, the guys would mostly hang out with each other. The girls would mostly hang out with each other. Now it seems like because of this, uh, I, I've observed that uh, there, the feminine qualities have become diluted with masculine qualities. The masculine qualities have become diluted with feminine qualities. And at the same time, it's just like, you have like this fulfillment of like this interaction with the opposite gender. And then of course, with, um, you know, access to all sorts of different type of pornographic images online, like you get access to those types of lust to get fulfilled. So it, it almost like that basic drive of like, okay, I want to be able to get married so I could have a companion in the opposite gender. It just seems like a lot of the wind in those sails has been taken out at an early age. What would you, what are your thoughts on that? I agree in that, that gender segregation or separation has kind of been done away uh, with or eroded. And the, what would give someone the himma to get married uh, and, and seeking and desiring to have that companionship has been uh, eroded greatly. I'll also say that because of the freeness of gender interaction, and actually for young males to have a level of haya that don't have marriage facilitated from, for, from them, it has produced in some of them and some young males a type of very bizarre social awkwardness in which they don't even know how to go to an elder if they see a, a young lady they're interested in they don't even know the proper way or maybe they don't even have the fortitude of even building up the courage to even going and say look i'm interested in such and such and i like to talk with her to see if we can get married even like the halal way right and mm. and especially especially with this culture where if you show interest in a, in, in a woman, it could be flipped back on you and you could be accused of doing some sort of abuse or some sort of misogyny, or, you know, mm -hmm. you've, you've, you've violated someone's right and did a so-called microaggression just because you sent word through somebody that you're interested in talking to them for marriage that could even be seen as offensive. So, Many people, mm -hmm. I think there's also a level of of people being scared of even wanting to interact or not interact, but to even contact women for that out of fear that maybe they'll be called out on the internet or get slandered or have some sort of false accusation. There's many different layers. And so I, I agree with the part that you, that you did say about the level of free mixing has taken away the type of the mystery if we could say about how to talk to women I, and i'll give you a personal example when i got married mm. it was the sheikh of the masjid who introduced me uh but obviously you know i didn't go straight and talk with her i had to go yeah and and talk to the parents and then i went to the house and i sat and talked with them with him while she was in a whole nother room mm. and we talked things through and it wasn't until we got engaged that i was even allowed to call the home phone to talk to her because everyone didn't have a cell phone yeah. back then or smartphone for texting there were no smartphones to text back then i only could call the home phone once we were engaged yeah that yeah. was the good old days, you 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 youngins from the nineteen nineties. <laughs> you know, if it. you if you were to tell uh, if you were to tell a brother that today, like you know, go talk to the wali and go about this way, they would be scared out of their mind. The average guy would be like, because uh, I've I've had that conversation. I've told brothers, brothers like, oh, I'm interested. I'm like, okay, let's set up something where you can talk to the Wally. He's like, no, 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 no. I just want to talk to her first, see if she's interested, get to know each other first. I'm like, just go talk to to the Wally and life. And I and I and I told them, I said, take from my personal example. Uh, I can tell you, it makes life super simple, and there's way more baraka in it. But it's like the average brother, like I would say. 95 times out of 100, they are too scared to go through that process. 
Yeah, they are scared. And that's something that we need to reintroduce. And again, too, like even traditionally speaking, like even when you go to ask to speak to a sister, you would go with your father or go with your father and your brothers or go with an imam or sheikh. So it's not even like you're going alone. And that also speaks to your seriousness of your character. You're not just rolling up. You're trying to, you know, roll up on somebody by yourself. You're showing your seriousness by bringing your father. If your father's not alive or there, you bring your uncle, you bring your brothers, you have the imam come, and then you go and knock on the front door. You know, and I've told my daughters already, one just turned 17 yesterday, the other one's 15. And I'm like, if some joker tries to talk to you and he doesn't and he isn't uh come to me, then under no circumstances am I giving my blessings for anything going forward. He has to be a man and come to the front door. If he comes to the front door and he's serious uh, with his father, Mm. then he, then he, he, then, you know, then the young man will have a good shot. Mm. So it seems, uh, Sheikh, a key component then is we really need families on board. You can't just educate and develop uh, our men without having the mothers on board, without having the fathers on board. Like it, 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 like there needs to be like this support structure in place uh, to facilitate that development. It can just be like because I appreciate this guild system that you're trying to establish has a has a function and and role even in a, in a because it, the history comes it operating within an Islamic society, but especially living as a minority. We need to have our families on board because, you know, you, you could probably imagine that a brother develops a lot of these virtues, but then is going to be at odds maybe with his um, parents. And the parents are going to look at maybe things in a primary cultural lens. And so then he's just going to be at odds with that. And then maybe, OK, maybe I'll just give up. This is too hard. I'm just going to do it. Go the cultural route or the other route. You know what I mean? So it seems like we really need to almost have guilds for parents. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's true. And actually, I have two trips coming up soon, one to Memphis, Tennessee, and also another one to Atlanta. I've done one already in Richmond, Virginia. And um, where it's actually trainings and discussions for fathers or for young um young men who are just getting married, who are seeking to have children to go through some sort of remediation or some remedial training as far as sacred manhood and how to raise their sons. Because uh, there are some things that number one, we all need to brush up on, like, like, you know, we all need to learn more. But two, there's certain things that maybe we need to unlearn, like certain things maybe Mm -hmm. we we brought on that were cultural influences maybe are at odds with Fatua, right? Maybe that's not the standard that we need. So uh, at least to have, you know, workshops and trainings and let people talk through things and wrestle with things that are older, but definitely there needs to be uh, in the optimal uh, situation that people in the household are on board. But again, you know, we're dealing with a growing challenge and issue in 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 north america of absent fathers and it's the mothers who are raising up their sons alone and because they're raising up their sons alone and they feel like they have to protect their sons or their or their babies as they would call them then there's a level of overprotectiveness out of love like we're, we're not saying this is a bad thing but out of overprotectiveness and love they may be hindering the the healthy masculine development of their sons with this motherly smothering, right? And this is where, uh, as the African proverb says, the East African proverb, that it takes a village, right? It takes a village to raise a boy to be a man, right? So it's, it's, Mm. it's, ideally it starts in the household, but it's a communal effort. It's not just the, it's not just alone, uh, the effort of the household, but optimally, optimally, the community and the Fatua guilds plays a supporting role in reinforcing the foundation that starts in the home. 
what aspects of modernism should we avoid or severely restrict uh, in our, our, our young boys as they grow up? Like, should we put a zero tolerance on social media? Um, media in general now, like Disney has so much messaging now um, that's confusing people. You know, there, there, there's a lot of ideas out there that are trying to steer people away from that idea of manhood. What should we do in terms of protecting and shielding? What specifically should we do to shield uh, our, our uh, young boys as we're trying to train them to become men? Uh, well, first I'll go into something philosophical and then we'll go into the practical functional things that you mentioned. But philosophically speaking from a very young age and speaking to our boys, the raising the men, we tell them that human beings are only equal in two things. And that's what I was talking to my teacher in El Insania, in their basic humanity and in Ethawab Well Iqab, in rewards and punishments that they get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? For for their their intentions and their deeds in the in the afterlife right beyond that boys and girls are not equal there's 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 equity right in creation but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made as a physical and metaphysical reality that how he kept the balance that a boy's kamal or his perfection is being a man not saying that women should do everything equal or just like men and vice versa this is to be taught at a very young age because this whole thing of of, of gender equality, we simply aren't equal, right? And there are certain virtues that females and women have over men in certain aspects. There's certain fada'il that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave women folk over men and vice versa. There's certain fada'il and these just aren't socially. This is metaphysical as the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the narrated by Imam al-Tabarani rahimahullah ta'ala hadith Hassan. For every created thing, there's a deeper reality to it. So when we're talking about this issue of being a male to being a man, mm -hmm. it's not just in body parts and DNA. It's a metaphysical aspect that is behind this because we believe behind all physical, uh, uh, all physical manifestations are metaphysical realities. So we say, yeah, there's something deep in you spiritually metaphysically that makes you a boy to be a man and that gets drilled in them you aren't supposed to imitate things that girls do and don't look at yourself and girls as being the same this is the, the most important thing from a very young age and that and this used to be common sense but now yeah everything that used to be common is uncommon the second thing is the messaging that we need to police our children having access to right and this means more active parenting and this not pushing our kids in front of a tv screen or a laptop or a phone and you mentioned disney i think disney is one of the most satanic toxic uh elements that we can expose our children to disney literally mm -hmm. teaches children to question and undermine the authority of elders starting with their parents and more specifically the father right it is it is satanic mm -hmm. right so um we have to be extremely careful of the type of media uh that we allow our our, our children in general but our young boys in particular especially since we know that the gender confusion movement is active from disney to the rappers who are dressed up and wearing skirts you know, and and, 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 and and rappers, two guys kissing each other and, and all sorts of uh, and all sorts of foolishness that uh, are that are being pushed up as pop culture icons and, and so-called miles of success of what of what males are supposed to what they call reimagine. You reimagine masculinity. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the gaslight uh, traditional masculinity as toxic mas masculinity. <laughs> what do you think about that? 
we should never use that terminology, toxic masculinity. And I'll, and I'll give you two reasons mm. why. And I've said this publicly many times. I've even written an article about it. It's on um, Medina, it's on uh, El Medina Institute's website. I believe it's titled mm. Restoring Words Back to Their Proper Meanings. So number one mm. for us, orojula means masculinity or sacred masculinity according to Islam, orojula. Uh, and as we mentioned before, sacred manhood or masculinity is nothing too far to the right nor too far to the left. So behavior that would be bullying, brutish, or abusive, we don't say that's manly. We don't say that's masculine. So that isn't, that's mm. not called, so there's no such thing as toxic masculinity, right? Because if it's yes. toxic, it's not real masculinity. On the other hand, they have redefined certain things like men being stoic in the face of adversity. Like if you're fighting the enemy, you shouldn't be crying in front of your enemy. Oh, I'm scared. No, you're supposed to man up and challenge your enemy and put him in his place, right? Mm. Um, or to be saying that you're willing to stand up for the truth, even if it means your life, they define that as being toxic, right? And mm. so this is, again, the agenda of trying to emasculate males. And at the same time, the they will then celebrate a woman who is attributing some of the same attributes that they claim are toxic. Hmm. Yeah. But then there's no such thing called toxic femininity. And it's true. We shouldn't use the term toxic femininity as a response to toxic masculinity. There is no toxic masculinity and there is no toxic femininity. There is sacred fem there's sacred masculinity, which is the model of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we have, we have sacred masculinity. Then we have sacred femininity that we are shown in the four best women of the world. Asiya, Maryam, Khadija, and Fatima bint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those are our models of femininity. That's sacred femininity. Mm -hmm. Those four women are sacred femininity. Sacred masculinity, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You, you make a, a very good point. Unfortunately, many Muslims adopt this terminology or these terminologies, and that's what's confusing much of our community, especially our youth, they come up looking at certain uh, speakers uh, who appear to be mainstream using uh, m much of this terminology, and it becomes really confusing to them. And I agree with you completely. Like we, uh, from an Islamic perspective, masculinity in and of itself is not toxic. Similarly, as like the insan, in and of the human being, it's not a toxic, right? They can choose to do things that are uh, good or evil, but you're trying to now, I think it goes part and parcel with the identity politics where certain identities have become virtuous and certain identities are the defensive or have been uh, relegated, you know, to, uh, you know certain paradigms i i feel that this is an important work i feel that we we need to have these conversations and discuss some of these issues uh openly and forthrightly because of these types of issues i i feel that this uh, part of this what we really need to do is try to link this up with our educational system so we have islamic schools right uh across uh, you know, North America. What I've seen with many of these Islamic schools, uh, you might have a different experience, but a lot of these Islamic schools aren't a too much different than public schools. You, you know what I mean? Uh, they, they're Islamic schools. They'll teach certain Islamic subjects and whatnot. They try to have, uh, you know, somewhat to a, a degree like uh, Islamic decorum, but they're becoming really similar, especially here in Canada. There is you can you can't really d distinguish between the two. How can we uh, get some of these principles that you mentioned 
um, into our schools because I think that's where you're going to see, that's where actually these movements have focused, right? Like a lot of the progressive mo movements have focused on the schooling system to try to change the, the hearts and minds of our children. So I think we need to take some purposeful strategies and perhaps a lot of what you are proposing in these guilds can be implemented in the Islamic schools. What do you see needs to be rectified in our Islamic schools to make them congruent with um, this idea of uh, prophetic masculinity? And one point I want to see on the side, maybe you can comment, by the way, is that you make in the book, which I, 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 I really agree with because I've been saying this for years as well. Um, I think you you reference another book that, that mentions this, but you have uh, some female, like most of the teachers are females, right? And so sometimes they don't know how to deal with boys or they don't understand that boys learn differently than than women, right? Than girls do, right? So boys will learn uh, different than than girls. And so, for example, if a boy's really active, um, they'll almost classify uh, this boy as acting out. But the boy is different, right? The boys like they need to do that activity. They can learn a little bit, then they have to go wrestle for a little bit or something, right? So, in light of you know even that, like the 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 the, the like what's becoming normalized. So most of the teachers are just females, and then you just have a, a rigid idea of how to educate both boys and girls in, in the same way. But, you know, perhaps boys need a different type of an educational approach as opposed to girls. So uh, in, in light of, of the, especially that point that you mentioned in the book, what can we do in our Islamic school systems, um, you know, to, to make that better? So I'll work my way backwards just very briefly, even from a biological perspective, when children are growing and we know that males have more testosterone that is that that comes out especially when they're coming to the age of puberty than young women which brings about more energy and a level of more what we could say uh for lack of a better term or i mean i can come up with a better term but let's say a little more aggressiveness or a little more wanting to show that energy in in in, in, in physical form right um, that has to be factored in. And that's not even looking at it from uh, a metaphysical perspective. That's from it like, like physiology, right? This is like proven by science for those who claim they believe in science. And I think that in America, the far right and the far left are both anti-science, even though the far left, the progressive claim that the conservatives are against science. Um, now, going back to the other point, how do we make our Islamic schools better in, in teaching this subject? Without going through a lot of specifics, there's an effort right now that I know of, and I know of the two people. Uh, one brother's leading it up in, uh, with another academic at a university in Istanbul, and they're actively working on, I've been asked for my input on a curriculum that can be presented to Islamic schools in regards to, to systematizing at different age groups and levels, teaching these virtues of, of masculinity and manhood that would be uh, age appropriate. So there's a big project that's going on right now. I can't uh, get into it, but what I also will say, there's a summer program uh, that is teaching some of the um, older, males about this that Dr. Rajab is putting forward uh, at uh, Ibn Khaldun University in Istanbul. There's a, uh, a summer program that starts later on this month about Fatua, about this very mm -hmm. subject in raising up the males. But th there, there's, an, there's an international effort um, of, of, of people of like minds that want to introduce uh, some different language in a curriculum to our Islamic schools. Maybe some of them will reject it, but some of them hopefully will latch on to it. And one of the biggest challenges that we have is to come up with our own language and our own nomenclature to teach certain things instead of just being lazy and borrowing other people's curricula and what they've given us that's prepackaged. Because of mm -hmm. teaching these prepackaged curricula, um, that's not for, for our long-term benefit, even if it's easier 
for a school that maybe doesn't have a lot of resources, but it it could be unintentionally doing some harm. Do you believe uh, that uh, classrooms should be segregated? What are your thoughts on that? I believe in I believe in gender segregation in schools, one hundred percent. Especially when it gets to be the round, the age of children being in what we'd say maybe is around seventh grade in particular. From up, they mm. should be separated through those middle school and high school uh, ages. And there's studies that have been done in America, especially within the African American community, that shows the the academic difference of when males are in are in um what we could say blended classrooms with girls and boys that there is less academic achievement than when those young males are put in boys only classes males only classes their academic achievement goes up when girls aren't around Mm. and there's been studies done on this I'm I'm 100% for 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 gender segregation, uh, and it's not just for you know theological or fiki reasons. There's like even practical research that that uh, qualifies uh, this position of gender segregation. Uh, where can we get uh, this book? If we want to purchase this book, where can we find your book, Inshallah? So in Canada. You can go to to uh, Firdos Books. So you Google Firdos Books of Fatua, and the website will come up, mm. and that will be cheaper for you regarding the shipping. For those of you who are watching this podcast, who reside in America or or somewhere else in the West, the UK, you go to Imam Ghazali uh, dot com or Imam Ghazali Institute. Use Google my name and Fatua, and you'll see the book for sale at Imam Ghazali Institute. So that's where you can get the book uh, for those of you who are outside of Canada. Okay. Any last piece of advice for us, Sheikh? My last piece of advice, just for the listening audience in general, and this advice that is, is for myself, as well as you all, just a reminder that anything that goes outside the normative practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is detrimental. And any sort of philosophy, be it to the right or the left, that goes outside the parameters of the Quran and Sunnah, it is it is ultimately going to do long term harm, even if we perceive some immediate short term benefit in latching onto that philosophy. And that goes for mm-hmm. Raising males in the sacred manhood. It could be for raising females in the sacred womanhood. It could be in regards to dealing with gender issues. It could be in regards to race issues. It could be involved to any issue on a global level of even dealing with uh, illegal occupation of Muslim countries and Islamophobia. If there's any paradigm, mm-hmm that goes outside the Quran and Sunnah, even if it looks like it will give us a short-term gain, it will be to our long-term detriment if we latch onto that. And we ask Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us be of those who hold on tightly, firmly to the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Jama'ah, and to the congregation and the consensus of what this Ummah has always agreed upon. I mean, I mean, Jazamah Khair, Sheikh. We uh, once again appreciate the time and energy, your wisdom advice that you've given us, uh, not only in this book, this program, and uh, we'll definitely be having uh, fruitful discussions in the future. So uh, this is just another step, inshallah. There's a lot of challenges, and um, we have to set the example, right? Real men don't shy away from challenges. That's right. That's right. All right, Sheikh. So uh, to our audience, Uh, As always, remember, we live by the haq, we die by the haq, and just when you think life is stuck, tune in to life haq. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.